In this lecture, we're going to continue our exploration of electronic band structures. We're going to remain in two dimensions, but we're going to look at something a little more realistic and a little more interesting than a sheet of hydrogen atoms. So the topic of this lecture is the CuO2 2 minus layer. I picked this example for a couple of reasons. Now we have a structure that contains two types of atoms, which is something we haven't talked about yet. But the copper oxide layer is more than just a textbook example. It is the key building fragment in a whole family of very interesting compounds called the cuprate superconductors. So the compound that we see here on the left, lanthanum copper oxide, which has a layered perovskite structure, if you replace some of the lanthanum with a divalent cation, like strontium or barium, it oxidizes some of the copper from plus 2 to plus 3, and it triggers superconductivity. And when that was first discovered back in the late 1980s, uh, it sparked a real frenzy of activity. Let me point out that if you look at the drawing on the left, you see an octahedral environment around the copper. But because this is copper 2 plus, we have a very pronounced Jan Teller distortion. And so the axial bonds that are in the same layer with the lanthanum cations are actually quite long. And if we ignore those long bonds, we can think of the copper as just being in a square planar environment. And that's what we're going to do for the rest of today's lecture. We're just going to take this two-dimensional sheet that has a copper 2 plus ion surrounded by four oxygens in a square planar environment. Now the unit cell of our two-dimensional structure here is just this square with copper ions at the corners and oxygen at the middle of each edge. Over on the right, I show the MO diagram for copper 2 plus ion in a square plane of ligands like oxygen. The key point of this MO diagram is that the d x squared minus y squared orbital is at a much higher energy than the other four d orbitals because it is pointing directly at the oxygens and therefore is sigma antibonding. Let's jump ahead to the results of the band structure calculation right here at the beginning and then we are going to work backwards to try and rationalize why this band structure is what it is. On the left, I've shown the calculated MO diagram for a copper 2 plus ion coordinated by four oxide ions in a square planar environment. The calculations are done at the extended Huckel level of theory. And so we do see, first of all, that we have 4d orbitals here at, say, minus 13 to minus 14 electron volts. Those are our dxz, our dyz, dxy, and dz squared. And then up here, uh, several electron volts higher, we have our dx squared minus y squared, our sigma antibonding MO. Uh, in this MO diagram, we also have a bunch of orbitals down here. And these orbitals are going to be predominantly oxygen 2p in character with some uh, mixture of copper in several of the orbitals to create bonding MOs. So if we were to take the molecular orbitals from our MO diagram, and just kind of broaden them out into bands, we could make some approximation of the density of states plot. And so the density of states plot, shown here in the middle, can be divided into three different regions. So this lower blob that I've marked with the Roman numeral 1, those bands that make up this region of the electronic structure are either oxygen 2p non-bonding or copper oxygen bonding. And not surprisingly, we would expect the most bonding states to be down here at the bottom and the ones that have the least amount of bonding to be up here at the top. Then we have this region marked with the Roman numeral 2. And this is going to come from our four 
d orbitals that are not pointed at the ligands. For the d x y, the d x z, and the d y z, we can call these pi antibonding molecular orbitals, which should lead to pi antibonding bands. And then there's also the dz squared, which is not a pi interaction, but is only weakly antibonding. And then finally, we have region three of our density of states plot, which is our sigma star band that comes from the d x squared minus y squared orbital. This band is only half filled because the d x squared minus y squared orbital has only one electron. Now, over here on the far right is what's called a partial density of states diagram, and that's a useful tool if we want to see where certain orbitals are contributing to the electronic structure. So the things that I want to point out is that if you look at the d x squared minus y squared, we can see down here at the bottom, it makes some contribution. Right? Those are the bonding interactions between the d x squared minus y squared and the oxygens. And up here at the top, we see the antibonding interactions. Right? And the relatively large splitting between these two is because this is the d orbital that has the strongest bonding interactions with oxygen. Uh, the d x y orbital, which like the oxygens, resides in the x y plane and can form pi and pi star interactions with the oxygen, has the next highest amount of splitting. So we see here in our oxygen bands, we have bonding molecular orbitals or bonding character to our bands. And then up here in this region two, we have the antibonding interactions between the dxy and the oxygen. The dxz and the dyz are very similar. Right? They can also form pi bonding and pi antibonding interactions with the oxygens. And then the dz squared, you notice, is almost all right here in this very narrow energy region. Right? The dz squared is going to have a very weak interaction with the oxygen, and so that's going to make it more or less non-bonding. One last thing to say about our density of states diagram is the relative areas of these regions of the DOS plot. If you think about region 3 and region 2, both of those come from the copper d orbitals. But in region two, we have four copper d orbitals all contributing to this region, whereas in region three, we only have one. So the area here should be only one-fourth as big as the area here. Then what about region one? Well, the dominant orbital contributing there is the oxygen 2p. There are two oxygens per copper and each oxygen has three 2p orbitals, so there should be a total of six bands in this region. And so it should be about 50% more area than region two because that's made up of only four bands. Now, we can't get too much further from our MO diagram here than the density of states. If we wanted to say a little bit more about how wide those bands are and plot something like the electronic band structure itself, the spaghetti diagram, we've got to look at the orbital overlap. So let's do that for two bands, starting with the dxy band. Okay, so the dxy band, the one that's higher in energy, that is the anti-bonding interaction between the dxy orbital and the oxygen 2p orbitals. So here I've drawn that interaction for our motif for our basis set. It's one copper and two oxygens, right? That is the contents of the unit cell. The next step is to take this basis and apply the e to the ikx term at different k points to map out how the phases of the orbital change from one unit cell to the next. So let's start at the gamma point where kx and ky are both zero. Here I've separated the copper orbitals and the oxygen orbitals on two different diagrams just for clarity. So because we're at gamma, it means that if we move to a neighboring unit cell, the phase of the orbital doesn't change. 
And so we can see here that all of the copper dxy orbitals, they all have exactly the same phase. Now, the same must be true for the oxygen. So if we apply that rule, we would get these oxygen 2p orbitals. Notice that for the vertical ones, the shaded lobe is pointing up in all cases. And for the horizontal ones, the shaded lobe is pointing to the left in all cases. The next thing is to say, all right, how are these going to interact with each other? And the answer is the interaction is going to be zero. To explain why that is, let's take one of these copper dxy orbitals. Let's take this one here right in the middle. Let's plop it in over here on the oxygen and look at the net interaction between copper and oxygen. So the lobe that goes off this way, that would have a bonding interaction with the oxygen 2p orbitals. But the lobe that goes in the opposite direction, right, it's also shaded dark, it's going to have an anti-bonding interaction with the oxygen 2p orbitals. If we were to look at the other two lobes, the one that comes this way and this way, they're going to encounter oxygen 2p orbitals of opposite phase. And so that's also going to be equal bonding and anti-bonding overlap. And so the net interaction is equal parts bonding and anti-bonding. And, and when we see that, what it means is that these two sets of orbitals have different symmetries, and they're not permitted to mix by symmetry. So they're going to remain non-bonding at the gamma point. And this copper DXY band that we're interested in, we can just call it non-bonding copper DXY at the gamma point. Well, how does this picture change if we go to the M point, where the KX and the KY are both equal to pi over A? Right, so that point means that when we translate by one unit cell vector in either the X or the Y direction, the orbital phase has to change. So here I've gone one unit cell in the X and one unit cell in the Y. Notice that that copper DXY orbital has the opposite phases now. If I translate by one more unit cell, I'm going to change the phase again, which will make it look like the copper DXY orbital at the origin. And if I keep going, every time I move one unit cell in either the X or the Y direction, the phases of the copper orbitals change. We're going to do exactly the same thing for the oxygens. All right. So here, notice I've translated by one unit cell in the X, I change the phase. Translate by one unit cell in the X, and I change the phase. Translate here by one unit cell in the Y, and I change the phases. And translate here by one unit cell in the Y, and I change the phases. And I can keep doing this for the rest of the oxygens in the unit cell. And when I do, I would get this picture. Now let's try and bring these two sets of orbitals together, right? Because in fact, they are all part of the same crystal. And when we do that, now we see everywhere an anti-bonding pi interaction. So this crystal orbital represents the most anti-bonding pi interaction we can get between copper DXY and oxygen 2P sets of orbitals. What about the D X squared minus Y squared band, right? That's the band that's at the highest energy. It also happens to be the band where the Fermi level cuts through, and that makes it the most important for the properties. Here I've drawn the antibonding sigma interaction between the DX squared minus Y squared orbital on copper and the oxygen 2P sigma orbitals. We can do the exact same analysis that I just walked through for the DXY band here. At gamma, right, the phases of all the copper orbitals must be the same, as shown here. And we also have to have the same thing for the oxygen 2p sigma orbitals. OK, so notice that all of the horizontal oxygen 2p sigma orbitals have the shaded lobe pointed to the left. And all of the vertical 
oxygen 2p orbitals have the shaded lobe pointing down. Just like we saw at gamma for the dxy in the oxygen 2p, here we cannot get any mixing by symmetry. Everywhere there's a bonding overlap, there's an equal and opposite antibonding overlap. So there is no mixing of these two orbitals at gamma. However, that's not to say that the copper dx squared minus y squared orbital is completely non-bonding at gamma because the lower lying oxygen 2s orbitals, which we've neglected up to this point, do have the right symmetry to mix in an anti-bonding way with dx squared minus y squared orbital at gamma. The anti-bonding interaction is somewhat weak because the oxygen 2s orbitals are not energetically very well matched to the copper 3d, but it's not zero. What happens when we go to the m point? Well, now it's kind of a familiar story. If I move one unit cell in the x or in the y directions, I'm going to change the phase of my orbital. So I'm going to do that first for my copper d x squared minus y squared. Then I'm going to do that for my oxygen 2p orbitals. And now let's look and see if we can have an interaction between these two. If we superimpose the two on top of each other, what we see is everywhere we get this sigma antibonding interaction between the copper dx squared minus y squared and the oxygen 2p sigma orbital. And we can do this same kind of analysis at x. And here I show a picture which has the interactions of these two d orbitals at gamma, at x, and at m. And you can see that both of them have their minimum energy at gamma. They become antibonding in one direction when we go to the x point. And then they become antibonding in both directions when we go to the m point. So the energy is going to increase as we go from gamma to x to m. So we can come and draw our band structure now. Probably it's easiest to see this dx squared minus y squared band. Lowest energy at gamma raises as we go to x, and raises again as we go to m, and then of course sinks back down as we come back to gamma. Uh, the copper dxy band does something similar. It would be here, and then here, and then down when we come back to gamma. This band that's almost flat, that's our copper dz squared band, so it has minimal interaction with the ligands. And then we see for the dxz and the dyz, they go from non-bonding at gamma to anti-bonding at x and m, although not quite as anti-bonding as the dxy. There are also corresponding bonding orbitals down here that mirror, basically, these antibonding orbitals. Remember the ratios here. There should be six oxygen 2p bands, and that's what we see. And there should be four d bands at the lower energy, and we do see one, two, three, four bands. And then finally, one half-filled band at a higher energy than the other d bands. And that's the copper dx squared minus y squared band. So just to summarize, before we leave two-dimensional band structure, here are some things to keep in mind when you look at a band structure plot. First of all, what's being plotted? Energy on the y-axis, k vector on the x-axis. And what the reciprocal space k vector tells us is how the phases of the orbitals change as we move from one unit cell to the next. And we saw also that that is related to the crystal momentum of the electron. How many lines are there in a band structure diagram? Or if you think of it as a spaghetti plot, how many pieces of spaghetti in the diagram? One band for every atomic orbital in the unit cell. What is the energy position of the band? Well, the center of gravity of most of the bands can be inferred from the energy of that orbital in the molecular orbital diagram of the building unit. We can tell if a band is going to go 
uphill or downhill as we go from, say, gamma to m by looking at the orbital overlap, as we just did. When we look at a band structure diagram and we want to predict something about its properties, the easiest thing to do is to say that generally we expect that when the Fermi level cuts through a band, there should be metallic conductivity. And when there's a gap between the filled and the empty bands, we expect either semiconducting or insulating behavior. The last thing to remember is that when we have wide bands, it means that there's a lot of overlap between orbitals from one unit cell to the next. Because to be a wide band, it means at some values of k, the bonding must be very different than it is at other values of k. And this can only happen if we have a lot of interaction from one unit cell to the next. So wide bands generally are associated with delocalized electrons, provided that the band is not com either completely filled or completely empty. And then narrow bands, like flat bands, like the dz squared we saw in the last example, those are when the orbital has minimal overlap with atomic orbitals in neighboring unit cells. So that would correspond to something that would be quite localized. Remember these ideas as we move on to three-dimensional band structure.